Hi, everybody, and welcome to Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, as we continue our Learning 2030 series. That's TVO's year-long special look at how technology is transforming how we learn, what we learn, and where we learn it. And in the spirit of think globally but act locally, we have come to Peterborough to try to understand how the globalizing reach of digital technology affects individual teachers working in their particular classrooms. And we are here in this truly, it's called the Great Hall, and it is a great hall, a beautiful, beautiful room here at Trent University. We've been here all weekend long experiencing all that this university and the city of Peterborough have to offer. On the heels of our Idle No More coverage, we heard from indigenous youth about how they see the future of Aboriginal education on and off the reserve. We saw future graduates at work as TVO Kids and the Mozilla Foundation hosted lots of children creating websites, designing apps and games at our Hive event. And we're going to keep things rolling tonight. Even if you weren't able to join us here in Peterborough, you can participate in our program. We're live streaming this on our homepage. That's the agenda.tvo.org. Our online editor, Daniel Kitts, and our online producer, Naveen Vaswani, are both hosting a live chat on that website, theagenda.tvo.org. You can send us your thoughts as well via Twitter and use the hashtag learning2030. We have you. We have our audience here in the Great Hall. We have a panel of guests standing by waiting to participate in our discussion. But off the top, we're going to talk to this man right here. This is one of the biggest names in education. He's Michael Fullen, Professor Emeritus at OISE, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, former special educational advisor to both Premier Dalton McGuinty and former Prime Minister of the UK, Tony Blair. He's got a new book out called Stratosphere, Integrating Technology, Pedagogy, and Change Knowledge. Earlier today, we heard you share some big ideas on our program, Big Ideas, and that will, uh, if people want to know more about that, they can go to the Big Ideas video page and see that speech. And in the meantime, welcome to Trent. Thank you. Good to be here. Let's start with this, Michael Fulham. We know that uh, we have seen independent studies that suggest that Ontario has one of, if not the best, school system in the English-speaking world. And I wonder if that's the case, why are you talking about radical changes that you think we need? Well, two reasons. One is, as good as it is, it's not that great, actually, uh, when you look closely at it. Uh, 82% uh, high school graduation, that's a big gap there. Uh, sub subgroups, Aboriginal students uh, doing poorly. Uh, literacy, 70% at the high measure. Take the EQAO, our assessment scores. The highest level of performance is where, where really the critical skills are is level four. The percentage of students achieving level four all through this last decade is stuck at 13%. So if you put your critical hat on, it's not all that great. Uh, similarly, inside the system, uh, on the same point, uh, students are all, not all engaged. There's a degree of boredom in there that uh, increases as you go up the grade levels. So that's one reason. The other reason is if you uh, stand still, you go backwards. It's hard to do, but, but when you look at the world, uh, these other countries that we're interacting with in Finland and Singapore, uh, England these days, but trying to get back on the, on the road to development, there's tremendous global development going on in education. And if we don't act, we'll be left behind. I suspect everybody in this room remembers the three R's, which we had to learn when we were growing up. And you have now changed that from three R's to six C's that you think we need to know. And let's just bring them up and then I'll ask you about them. The six C's are character education, citizenship, communications, critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration, and creativity and imagination. I got to tell you, I think the three R's were easier to remember than the six C's, <laughs> but I appreciate why you think these are important. Yeah. Which one of the six do you think represents the most significant break with the past? Well, I want to say first that in all of the educational examples we see in the province that are working on these, they're working on two or three of them simultaneously. So it seems like six, but it's really probably three, because when you do critical thinking, you're doing collaboration with students and you're you're uh, communicating, so there's quite a bit of synergy around them. Uh, I think of the ones that are prob the one that's probably, it's hard to pick a, a, a one that's very uh, important, but I I'll say creativity and imagination. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson's uh, lament about the system, uh, systems focusing too much on literacy and not enough on the imagination and thinking. So that's probably the one that's uh, most neglected, although I might put a charge in for character education and citizenship. 
We should mention, I mean, you're on the Big Ideas video mm -hmm. page, but if anybody hasn't seen Sir Ken, go to YouTube and look at his stuff. He's a great speaker, too, Absolutely. isn't he? Absolutely, yes. We've had him up here, and mm -hmm. he's fabulous. Hmm. Okay, what are the qualities that we should look for in teachers who will be, mm -hmm. actually, let me take a step back. We've called this series Learning 2030, because when we started it last year, if a mm -hmm. child was born last year, by the time they turn 18 and are ready to go off to post-secondary, they're going to be, mm -hmm. it's the year 2030. So yeah. we wanted to imagine what the education system was going to look like in the year 2030. And I want to know what the qualities that we should look for in teachers who will be teaching a child born today who will be graduating in 2030. We did uh, another recent book with my colleague Andy Hargraves called The Professional Capital of Teachers. And it says there are three things. The human capital, which is their talent as individuals. Social capital, their ability to work with other teachers. And decisional capital, which is the one that's very important. What decisions are they making day after day that's best for this student who's different than that student? So uh, I think the qualities are a teacher who clearly, uh, to begin with, has a commitment to uh, the betterment of students, to raise the bar, close the gap, the moral imperative. Uh, but being uh, committed is not enough. You have to be good as well. You have to be skilled. You have to be effective. So the second set then has to do with the efficacy of teachers, which is their digital prowess, their ability to uh, be uh, uh, partners with students, uh, maximizing the involvement of students in the engagement, their capacity to enable students to work with each other. That's just among students. And then you have another set, commitment to continuous learning. The profession is you have to learn all through your career, any profession these days. Uh, the commitment and capacity to work in teams, very big. Students, we want to do that. Teachers have to do it. So collaboration is another one. Uh, and then um, paying attention to uh, what impact am I having, but also what impact are we having. We want the teacher in the classroom to feel a responsibility for how well the school is doing, the whole mm -hmm. school. We want that school to be, uh, have a commitment to how well is the district doing at uh, 20 schools or 200 if you're in York Region. So there's a really big ask of teachers uh, for this uh, century that is much bigger, much more exciting, and much more demanding. Let me pluck one more thing off that list that you just talked about, and then we're going to get some other people involved in the discussion as well, and that is technology. You yeah. are looking for a, essentially a technological revolution, not just in our individual schools, but across the whole education system. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how important you think it is for the teachers themselves to be tech savvy. Well, it's... It's certainly everybody has to be tech savvy for the future. And the good thing is we're gaining on it because uh, the young people coming up into being in the teaching profession are more tech savvy just uh, you know, year by year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's critical, but they also have to be uh, critical consumers of technology. Not all technology is good. You can get, uh, you can get overboard on the sheer amount of information. Uh, you have to be able to... Uh, you have to be able to position technology in relation to the six C's we talked about and maximize that impact. Uh, but what you don't have to be is you don't have to be the, the, uh, the, the most technological savvy in the room. It could be t students that are that. So you don't need the technical proficiency all the time. You can get that. Don't worry but if the need... kids know more than you do about Absolutely. this stuff. Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a win win because the teachers are doing some of your work. The teach I mean, the students are. The students feel better because they're part of uh, action. Uh, and so uh, reduce your need to be in control of the technological expertise and increase your capacity to bring out learning in students. Okay. I want to share some numbers right now with the people who are watching us both at home and here in the Great Hall. Here's what we're talking about. How many teachers do you think there are in the province of Ontario? 115,000 primary and secondary teachers in the province who teach at 5,000 primary and secondary schools if we go to the budget year 209-10, their combined salaries represented almost half the provincial education budget. Now, what do they think about technology? Well, York University did a study on this, and we got the results off something called mindsharelearning.com. 42% said they didn't have sufficient internet access. 53% of teachers said they didn't receive an information and communications technology plan. And 41% worked in schools without BYOD policy. What's BYOD policy? Bring your own device. Bring your own device. Okay. Yep. When I was growing up, it was BYOD. No, yeah. never mind. That's a different thing. <laughs> that was kind after of thing. school, hopefully. It was different. <laughs> <laughs> one more thing. Let's share one more set of numbers here. This is uh, technology in American classrooms among medium and secondary school teachers in the U.S. 
73% of their students use their mobile phones in the classroom. 45% of their students use e-readers. 43% use tablet computers in the classroom. 41% report a major impact by requiring more work to be an effective teacher. Okay, we chew on all of those numbers and we're going to discuss them more as the course of the hour goes along. Before we meet our other guests, though, let's uh, spend just a minute here or so uh, with a man who spent a lot of money uh, trying to improve the education system, certainly south of the border, and what makes for a good teacher. Here's Bill Gates. Roll tape, please. Well, it turns out that the way you engage the class uh, is a critical difference. So an average person, average teacher comes in, and th this is only through research, we know, we know this, they pretty much know what they're going to present during that class. And looking at the students and seeing if they're sort of fidgeting, uh, moving their leg, you know, there's a lack of energy in the room, going in, asking them questions, getting them engaged, uh, seeing if they can write to topic. The, the best teacher is very uh, interactive. It's, it's more performance oriented. It's amazing that the difference between the very best teachers and, and the ones that are the, the worst is incredible. Even from the best to the average is a dramatic difference, and yet we don't really look into why that good teacher is so good uh, and try and capture it so that we can help the average teacher move up to, say, the, the top core child. If we did that, we'd have the best education system in the world. But our teachers get the least feedback. Over 95% are never told what they're doing well, what they're not doing well. And it, it just doesn't uh, drive excellence to not know uh, what, where you, what you need to work on. Bill Gates. Let's uh, just take a few seconds here and reset our broadcast. We are in the Great Hall at Trent University here in Peterborough, Ontario for the latest installment in our Learning 2030 series. We are imagining an education system for a child born last year, this year, what will that education system look like by the time he's ready or she's ready to go to post-secondary education in the year 2030? We are live streaming this discussion as we speak, so we hope you're dialing us up on the agenda.tvo.org to enhance your participation in the broadcast, or if you want to tweet your thoughts on what you're hearing, hashtag learning2030 is the hashtag that we would like you to use. Now, joining our discussion, Kathy Bruce, who's the Associate Professor at Trent University's School of Education and Professional Learning. Ron Canuel is the President and CEO of the Canadian Education Association. And Camille Rutherford is Associate Professor in the Department of Teacher Education at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario. And we thank you three for joining Michael Fullen, who has also joined us up on stage for the discussion. Camille, uh, to you first. We heard in that Bill Gates clip a lot of words but actually not the word technology, which is a little unusual for the founder of Microsoft, but there you have it. You teach teachers how to teach, and I'm wondering how important you think, same question I asked Michael Fullen, how important is it that they be tech savvy? I have to be honest, I'm, I'm a, I have a bit of an issue with the term tech savvy. What would you prefer? Um, I think tech enabled teachers. Um, tech savvy means you know how to use your phone, you know how to use your tablet, but do you know how to use it within the classroom to support student learning? Those are two very different things. I know how to read. Does that mean I know how to teach people how to read? So I think it's very important to understand that difference. Okay. Um, and I think that it's not just about the technology. When we look at the competencies or the six C's that Dr. Fullen was talking about, um, some of those are related to technology, but very often we don't need technology to support collaboration, critical thinking, creativity. And so very often people get too bogged down in that, oh, we need the technology to drive these competencies, when really it's technology enables us to use those in, in uh, more engaging ways. And I think that's what we really need to think about. So for our new teachers, our teacher candidates that I work with on a daily basis, it's about how do I use these technologies, combine that with my pedagogical knowledge, my content knowledge, my knowledge about my students, and create engaging learning experiences for our students. Kathy, speaking of those younger teachers, my hunch is, the assumption is, they're more tech-enabling, is that the word? Yeah, that's yes. the one we're working with? They're better at this stuff than, say, people who've been in the system for 25 years. Is that true? 
I would say that the students that I'm working with, the teacher candidates I'm working with, are very eager to be engaging with technology to maximize student learning. And uh, the uptake, though, in schools is remarkable as well. And so I'm working in collaboration with teachers across Ontario who are trying to figure out how to maximize the use of technology so that it is actually uh, enhancing the learning. And uh, it's, it's just incredible when teachers are given the opportunity to learn together. I think one of the issues is access to those professional learning opportunities, whether they're pre-service or in-service. Gotcha. Canadian Education Association, you did some studying on this issue. And you found that student engagement levels peter out the older that students get, which is certainly not what we want. Uh, somebody in grade five, their intellectual engagement level might be at 82%. By the time it gets to grade 11, it drops off to 41%. Uh, this suggests that nearly six in ten students, Ron, uh, especially in the higher grades, are just going through the motions. And I'm wondering what kinds of qualities do you think teachers need to have in order to counteract this very troubling trend? It's a great question. And it's a, it's a, a research right now of 67,000 students across Canada, so it's, it's an extremely large, let's just say, sample size. What teachers can do to address this issue is that I think they fundamentally have to look at within the structures that they work within. The, the, the structure as it stands now is a structure that does value very much compliance and conformity. It doesn't allow for risk taking. It doesn't allow for creativity. It doesn't allow for these notions that need to be developed exactly as what Camilla and, and, and Kathy were saying to really develop themselves within a classroom. So there is a, a major leak constraint that's being imposed and even more so now because of our increased tendency to move towards accountability and greater accountability and performance measurements, and, and uh, this is putting a lot of extreme, uh, extreme pressures on, on the teachers that, quite frankly, are the wrong pressures to put on them. Michael Fulton, let me follow up with you, because in your Big Ideas lecture, you pointed out more than 90% of children, when they enter the school system in kindergarten, are highly engaged, excited about education. By the time you get to grade, what was it, nine? It's at right. 37%. Yeah, very similar figures. How, how do we arrest that trend? That's just appalling. Well, we're, some of the people on the panel are working on that as well, which is, uh, uh, and I said in the lecture, we have to change the nature of the educational experience to have students as greater partners in the learning and to use the 24-hour clock instead of just the six hours during the day, but to be purposeful, to pursue the critical thinking. And on the question of accountability, uh, um, uh, if I lived in the United States, I would be much more worried about that. Uh, I mean, we have... Uh, we don't have an oppressive accountability system now, I think, in Ontario, but it could happen, so I think we should be prepared for it. But there is room right now uh, to develop this engagement. And uh, if you take my first criterion, which was irresistibly engaging for students, mm -hmm. if it doesn't meet that, you don't even uh, get a start. Well, Bill Gates talked about per performative skills, I think was the way he put it. If you're a teacher, you better know a little something about showbiz. Is that fair to say? You know what I mean, Camille? <laughs> yes. I think this is, uh, we are expecting something from our students that we don't expect from ourselves. So when we talk about these 21st century skills, collaboration and creativity and things, we're expecting them to go down a path that we haven't been down ourselves. And that's one of the biggest problems that I see that we have um, right now. So how do we expect 21st century uh, pedagogy to be in the classroom when our teacher candidates, our veteran teachers, our mid-career teachers haven't been down that path? They're not used to using those uh, technologies or developing those skills within themselves, and now they have to develop those within someone else. So I think that's very challenging. And all of these things that we expect from our students, we need to expect those from our teachers and our school leaders as well. Ron, can I ask you a real smart aleck question here? Sure. All right, let's go. What percentage of the teachers in the classroom today have the performance skills or don't, are technology enabling or aren't? What's the number? Well, I would tell you in my former district, at the Eastern Township School Board in the province of Quebec, it's at 98% since we've had a one-to-one -one employment since 2003, and the only district in Canada. In the rest of Canada, I would suggest it's under 25% with respect to the technological skills to be able to pull it off, what we're expecting them to do. And we did this in a research just recently called Teaching the Way You Aspire to Teach, where we surveyed teachers and met with teachers across Canada. And it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating to hear these teachers articulate the fact that they wanted to use the technology but we're being prevented to from the filters, the policies, the constraints that really just aren't enabling this. We, we have to inject a lot of trust 
into this system now because I think the more we trust our educators, the better things will become. But we've got to, that leap of faith has to happen. What do we say, Kathy, to, to trustees or principals or whomever who say, if you let kids have these devices in the classroom, they're just going to be texting each other the whole time and it'll be a waste of time to have it in there. There are always attitudes or, or of resistance to technology, and no matter where you are. And I think one of the things we really want to pay attention to is the how factor versus the wow factor. So when we get new technology in the room and it's a novelty, we think, wow, this will really engage kids. It will make it fun for them. And I'm cautious about that because I think it has a short lifespan. I think we really need to be thinking about how we use that technology to engage learners, how we're using the technology to help learners become producers of knowledge as opposed to consumers of knowledge. And this is a big issue around new technologies where I might just want to be entertained. And we really uh, need to think about how we support teachers in developing the skills to be those change agents that we're hoping they will be and taking advantage of the technologies to do so. Well, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Ron, which is what, what percentage of teachers in the system today do you think can perform versus can't are technology enabling versus aren't? Um, I'm happy to take his figure of 25% on the average, but I do want to say again that we talk about policy drivers, and we say technology should not be a policy driver. It, pedagogy should be the driver. And What's the difference? The difference is that you are looking for, uh, on purpose, for the technological uh, uh, expertise and uh, devices and applications that will accelerate the learning of students for particular purposes, and that the teacher is orchestrating that, is designing that. So it's not at the mercy of technology. But I would say, though, uh, uh, that we need to take the risk on letting technology permeate, which will have the downside and the upside. We have to take that risk right. and get better at then sorting it out. If you, st if you try to hold back and sort it out in advance, it ha it's happening anyways, it'll just get worse. So I'm, I'm, I'm for risk taking. Go open for it, take it in there, but know what you're doing and try to sort it out. And I'm gonna say students will gravitate towards exciting learning if you do it well. Ron, a follow? Just to briefly say that it it's, shouldn't be called technology and learning, technology in learning. And we don't separate technology. This has been the big problem over the last few decades is that technology has always been isolated. There are technology conferences. I don't see textbook conferences, okay? <laughs> I don't see pencil conferences, okay? But I see technology <laughs> conferences. This all gotta be stop. together. You gotta bring it together. Okay. Uh, while you four are experts, we actually have an honest-to-goodness high school student in this room right now that Excellent. we're going to talk to to Good. see if all of your expertise is actually being manifested <laughs> in his classroom. So let me come on over here and talk.